It's time for Twit, episode 249. Corey Doctorow and Robert Scoble join us this week to talk about all the drama with Facebook, the latest announcements from Google at Google I.O., and an email newsletter that sent out replies to everyone. It's all coming up this week in tech, right now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is... Twit. Audio bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by AOL Music and Spinner.com, where you can get free MP3s, exclusive interviews, and more. Video bandwidth for Twit is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y.com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 249, recorded May 23rd, 2010. Drama Hobbit. This Week in Tech is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Bring people across the country or around the world together with the web conferencing tool that's the best of the best. GoToMeeting. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com slash twit. And by Audible.com. To download two free audiobooks of your choice, go to Audible.com slash twit2. And don't forget to follow Audible on Twitter at Audible underscore com. And by the new Carbonite Pro. It's simple, secure, and affordable online backup for your small business. For a free trial and to learn more, visit CarbonitePro.com. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. This week's tech news digested and spewed forth by our resident pundits. Today we're welcoming back, and we're so glad to have him. Haven't been on in a couple of years. Corey Doctorow. Yeah, those two years coincide with when my daughter was born. Yeah. How's she doing? She's awesome. Two and a half years old, uh, turning into a little Disney nut. Uh, we put her to bed at night, and we go up 15 minutes later, and she's standing on the edge of her crib holding the, the rails and shouting, oh, Yo-ho, yo-ho, a pirate's <laughs> life for me! <laughs> now, she hasn't read Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom yet, I would guess. No, at two and a half, she's more into the uh, apple doggy. <laughs> but she does know we go, uh, her first word was Chewbacca. Oh, and, yeah, uh, now we're talking. Yeah. Yeah, and when you say, Posey, what sound does Vader make? She goes, <laughs> Very so it's good. pretty cool. You're raising an appropriate child for the uh, 21st yeah. century. Corey is, of I course, everybody that. knows, uh, a great science fiction author, and uh, his newest book just came out, FTW, for the win. It's juvenile, and we'll talk about it in just a little bit. He's on tour, and right now in North Carolina, on tour uh, doing readings. Uh, so it's great to have you back, and former uh, former um, EFF Europe guy, and uh, still very active in internet freedom. And boy, you, you haven't been here in so long. There's so much to talk about. I, I want to cover some stuff that might be old news, things like net neutrality with you as well. But sure. uh, today our big story will be Facebook, and there's a guy here who can help us with that, and that's Robert Scoble, the Scobelizer. Hey, Robert. Hey, how are you doing? Great to have you. Robert's been in the center of a little maelstrom that's been going on today over Facebook. We'll talk about that. But you were also at Google I.O., the big Google conference this week. And I got a new phone for free. You seem Disclosure, to... I got it for free. <laughs> <laughs> you like your Evo. Yeah, it's, it, it's uh, dramatically better than the iPhone in a lot of places, and we can talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. You wrote a good uh, post on Buzz, uh, pros and cons of uh, Android. I'm, I'm starting to become a big Android fan, and everybody I'm, here is I'm an Android probably. user. I know, because, Corey, you use a Nexus One. Yeah, it's been, you know, I tell you, it's been game-changing on the tour between uh, the really awesome turn-by-turn -turn directions, which has mm -hmm. saved uh, my media escorts bacon more than once going out to some school for a visit, and um, really good functional email, and tethering. Uh, tethering has been amazing, yeah. you know, because normally what happens on tour is you're, you're out from like 7 in the morning until 10 at night, you know, it's four schools, four media events, and a, and a book signing, and you go back to the room and you, you do email till 3 in the morning, and then you get up at 5 the next day, I mean, it's crazy, and with, with tethering, basically every time I'm done with a signing, I just jump on my laptop and get some work done, and I've been getting like almost 5, 6 hours sleep a night, it's been wicked. And that's even without the 4G. Uh, yeah, I imagine if you're in one of the 27 cities that have 4G, you'll have even uh, better results. So yeah, Robert, we do you get 4G used... in the Half Moon Bay? I know that some of San Jose uh, has it now. Uh, 3G here, and I didn't get it. I didn't 
sense that I was getting it in uh, San Jose, but I think I think last night I figured out how to turn it on. <laughs> so you right. actually have to go and right. actually opt in to 4G right. before you can use it. But we were uh, driving down Freeway 280 by Apple's campus, and we were on 3G, and uh, my son and I were iPadding in the car and watching videos and listening to music, and it was working just fine. They've turned on uh, in 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 uh, Froyo 2.2 on the Nexus One. Now they've got. Uh They've got a free tethering built in. T-Mobile doesn't charge extra for it. You have to pay thirty bucks mm. a month extra for it on the Evo. Yeah. Um, so this is this is definitely where uh, where Android's going, and it's in stark contrast to the iPhone, where tethering's been promised by AT and T for more than a year. <laughs> it's been someday, maybe. Well, I, I expect yeah. that it'll come this summer when the the four G iPhone comes out. I mean, Steve Jobs has been uh, writing his own slew of emails to bloggers today, saying uh, just wait and see and see that we haven't been leapfrogged by Google. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Is right. Well, I mean, even if they roll out tethering now, I mean, clearly they've been leapfrogged by Google because there's been tethering for a while on right. on the Nexus One. But um, I, I love the idea that AT and T and and these other um, carriers offer unlimited internet but don't let you plug it into a device of your choosing it's kind of like unlimited internet uh, all you can eat provided you're not very hungry right yeah well that's the ipad isn't it i mean you you get and at&t has said this again and again no we're not going to limit the internet on the ipad well of course not because mm. <laughs> because you can only use it on the ipad how bad could mm. it be although there well, are hacks that allow you to tether the ipad so uh, maybe it really? could be maybe it could be bad Maybe it could get worse. Let's talk about the Facebook thing. Now, uh, Corey, you, uh, The Economist had an article uh, about Facebook. The fa what, what do we call them? They're Facebook refuseniks. Those of us who have deleted our Facebook pages, uh, they mentioned you and me. Uh, mine will be effect effectively deleted on Wednesday. I, it takes two weeks because they only deactivate it in case you want to come back. Um, you're, you, you deleted yours as well. Yeah, and, and you know, it was, a, it was actually a little easier for me, I think, because... Um, I created a Facebook account just like I created, you know, a Six Degrees account, a Friendster account, and so on. I, I created it, used it for, you know, a week or two, and then abandoned it and didn't have anything to do with it, and just wrote a kill file in my mailer so that I didn't have to see it anymore and, and when it sent me messages. Um, so I'd just basically forgotten I had a Facebook account, and then I um, I started using my Nexus One and K9 Mail, which is a great little mailer for it, and because I don't have any of my kill files on K9, I was starting to see uh, all those messages from people who were friending me on Facebook. And I realized, hey, there's some people who for at least part of the reason for being on Facebook is that they're able to hook up with me. Uh, let's see if I can remove that incentive. Let's see if I can stop being part of the problem and start being part of the solution. So I resigned my Facebook account. Yeah, that was kind it was of funny. I did it. I did it because I had like ten minutes extra in an airport. I don't even remember which airport. <laughs> and and within ten minutes, like as I was getting on the plane, I got like nine press calls. I just you know tweeted kind of randomly along with all the other stuff that I was tweeting from the lounge. You know, resign my Facebook account. And you know, ABC News and CNN and everybody was like, you resign your Facebook account. Call us up because it's a thing of moment. Um, which was really funny. I should resign my Facebook account more often. <laughs> I know. I got more publicity, I'm sure, quitting Facebook than I ever got on Facebook. And, I, and yeah. I'm with you, Corey. You know, it's hard for me to, to tell people, you know, you should do the same thing because, let's face it, Facebook is hideously useful for a lot of people, including businesses, and um, uh, there isn't really much of an alternative. I, I, don't, I don't miss it at all, but I've got a website, I've got Twitter, I've got Buzz, I've got plenty of ways to connect with people. Um, I use Google Profiles as kind of a, a Facebook clone in the sense that if you Google me, you'll find that, and that'll tell you where else to go. But, mm. but do, are you saying site. Va what's the vanity site? Yeah, I've had Crap Hound for you know ever. Yeah, and so people so I, Google I, I, Corey it, Doctor, or they're going to find you. If you Google Corey, I'm like the first three results for Corey. Yeah, so. I'm pretty easy to find. I don't really have to worry about it. So you're right. I have a different circumstance from everyone else. What about people who use it to meet old friends um, or maybe they're small businesses that can't afford or don't want to take the trouble to do a website? They're going to stick around, aren't they? Yeah, I guess I guess until the number of people kind of uh, reach the number of people leaving reaches critical mass. I was talking with someone else about this a little while ago about what it would mean to um, to actually have some viable alternative. And, you know, I think if you actually did have a viable alternative, something that was more privacy respecting and so on, uh, you might could do something where, since Facebook is so aggressive about slurping information in from elsewhere, but doesn't allow any information out, um, maybe those of you who are kind of off Facebook 
could export your information to the people who are on Facebook somehow. I'm not really sure how that would work, but it seems to me that there's probably some meat on that bone if you wanted to start a service to kind of help people solve the collective action problem of, I can't leave Facebook but, until like these 20 other people do. But Leo, isn't this the real problem? You know, 13,000 people are on the Facebook group of quitting their Facebook on May 31st. That's probably fewer people than will join in five minutes on, on May 31st. Maybe 20. You know? Yeah, right. It's not a huge number of people. And, and, you know, when I talk to normal people outside the bubble, outside, you know, the media sphere and outside the geek sphere, I just don't hear the outrage. They People have already resigned themselves to that. The fact that privacy is changing. In fact, I, I just interviewed uh, the guys who do the calendar, uh, Tungle Me, and they just turned on a feature where they give people a choice of being public or being private. And something like 89% of the people turn on the public part. And they were shocked by that. They thought, my, you know, a calendar is the most private thing that, that they could think of. And they, mm. they were shocked that people were sharing. And now there's services like Blippi where you share your credit card. and Yeah, I share, I share on Blippi. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think that the problem with privacy is it's it's a little like the problem with, um, say, smoking, um, where the consequence of the decision is really far removed from the decision itself. So you do something that comes back to bite you in the ass, but the actual biting takes place really far in the future. <laughs> right. <And> so <laughs> it's it's very hard to learn from that stuff, right? Like think about um, about shooting film with film cameras, right? Back in the in the film camera days, excuse me, I'm going to try and get my camera lined up here. Back in the film camera days, um, you know, the average family would shoot like three rolls a year and you'd shoot one at Christmas, one on holidays and one on, one on um, or one at Christmas, one on birthdays, one on vacation. And, you know, if you got your roll of film back and you looked at the pictures, you go, well, I don't know what I did to this one to make it look so good and I don't know what I did to this one to make it look so crap and you never got to be a better photographer. Right. And just shortening that feedback loop without anyone actually sitting down and going, well, now I've got a digital camera, I'd better be a better picture taker. Shorting, shortening the feedback loop between taking and seeing made a huge difference. And privacy, it's really hard to ever learn to be a better privacy person because by the time the consequence of your action rolls around, it's been so long, you don't even remember what you were thinking when you made that calculus. I've got a, a, a story about this. Um, when I was in elementary school, I had a teacher who had a child who was born and then died shortly afterwards, and it was just, it was heartbreaking oh. for him and his wife. Sure. When the kid was born, they couldn't see any reason not to give uh, the marketing companies that were giving out free diapers and so on, their child's information and birthday and their their address. But, you know, 18 years later when they were still getting annual birthday cards from, you know, 100 marketing companies mm -hmm. along with baskets of stuff for their kid, you know, they were they were really regretting having made that calculus. It's a very hard thing to judge in advance. I mean, I think we go, people don't care about privacy and what we can't Dis disentangle from that is whether people just um, can't make good decisions about privacy in the moment. Yeah, I, I told my kids that. I said, uh, and this is actually what prompted me to delete the Facebook account, was I, I was talking to my kids and saying, you know, you can keep your Facebook account. You should understand that everything you put there ultimately could be public, so you shouldn't put anything there or anywhere, frankly, on the Internet that uh, mm. you wouldn't want parents, teachers, future employers to see, and they didn't get it. Yeah. Mm. They said, well, no, 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 Facebook's private, and so I'm going to continue to do this kind of thing because it's so useful, and I, I, I can't deny that it's very useful. And so that's when I started really getting to get worried that what we are, and I had the same exact reaction as you did, Corey, which is we're coercing people into using Facebook with by, merely by having a presence there. So I just decided, you know, I'm, I don't need to play there, and I'm not going to play there. And uh, But now there's been a bit of a, see, a big see, thing. I went the other way. Yeah, what did you do, Robert? I, I set all my privacy settings to as public as they can be. In other words, I took the, all the sliders and made them as public as I could be. Well, I did and that too, I, but that, and, and that, that's therefore, not the point. I know it. I know the difference. I know, but therefore, I behave in a way that I know it's going to be as public as can be. Any, anyways. I mean, look, look, look at how we treat Steve, uh, Steve Jobs, right? He emails people privately in a private email, and we take his emails and post it on our blog. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because I hadn't really thought about that. You posted this morning on your blog. Uh, why is it, you know, because uh, Zuckerberg sent you an email, which we'll talk about in a bit, responding yeah. to this whole Facebook thing. And you asked him for permission and, and noting in the blog post that why is it that others are so blindly willing to publish their email exchanges with Steve Jobs, as an example? Isn't that, aren't, shouldn't those be private as well? Now, I, I think it's pretty clear now that Steve understands that this is going to get published. He's been using it, frankly, yeah. as, as a yeah. megaphone. 
you know, we're public figures, right? That's different. Um, you know, the, the information about kind of what you're doing and who your friends are and so on, you, you've, 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 we've, kind of all made that decision to do that same with steve jobs and there's actually even something different at work when steve jobs emails you or me or or, or mark zuckerberg does in that if you email someone as a reporter working for a journalistic organ and say do you have a quote about this and then they send you an email back you don't you shouldn't have to email them and say do i have your permission to publish the quote that you just gave me i mean that that's yeah, i'm sure mark had the expectation that you would publish it robert i think it's not wrong to ask for permission yeah, I'm glad yeah, you did. I when think it's I interviewed him uh, right after uh, the F8 conference, in fact, he went through this quick uh, negotiation. Do you want to have a chat with me, uh, uh, which will be a little bit more open, or do you want to turn on your camera? And I find I find a lot of people really don't understand Mark and and don't understand where he's coming from, and so it'll be really interesting to see what he does this week because. Uh, he, I think he has a very intimate sense of privacy and where he, where the world is going with this and, and what, what um, you know, where the Facebook is going and where the world is going. And I, I haven't heard him speak about that openly. And I wish he would. I wish he would come out and just say, hey, here's my views on privacy and here's where I messed up because – well, he Facebook messed is, up in some, Facebook in some is ways that are really interesting by ruining our trust. Facebook's done some, some bad things. They, 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 yeah. they changed the policy multiple times. Then they didn't communicate very effectively about it. And I think that's really where they got in trouble. They didn't say, they didn't step forward as Google. I mean, look, Google had problems with Buzz, stepped forward. Google had problems with, the, with collecting this Wi-Fi data, stepped forward and spoke about it. And I think diffused it. Facebook yeah. has this, it's ironic for a company that's promoting public has this very uh, private point of view, like you know, they're hunkered down. Now, here's no, what happened today, and this uh, we can we ahead. can talk a little bit about this. I got an email from the uh, general manager of one of our radio stations. I'm on a I do a radio show that's uh, heard in about 111 stations, and one of them in Texas, KNOI, uh, has a two Facebook pages for the talk station and for uh, the rock station, both of which were disabled, and the, the general manager believes it was because he posted links to me deleting the Facebook page, links to Facebook privacy issues, and links to Diaspora, the uh, one of, you know, a Kickstarter project that uh, purports to be an open replacement for Facebook for NYU students are yeah. starting it. On the other hand, I've, I've linked to the same things, and I'm... Well, probably, it's inconsistent. I mean, we, we've, yeah. we've, there's no question... Look, there's no question that Facebook is deleting and censoring some people. We So I, I went on a rampage. I said, look, this is there's one thing to... To change your privacy policy is another thing to actually actively disable or delete comments that are not favorable towards Facebook. They have the right to do it, but boy, you really want to think now: Do I want to play in this space? This is this is actively seems actively evil to me. Um, and then and then I asked our people and the the listeners in the audience. I said, "Let's see if this works." Post: I'm thinking of deleting my Facebook page. I found a link on how to do it in the WikiHow page on how to delete your Facebook page. About half of our listeners reported that that post had disappeared within minutes of posting it. Uh, about half said, no, it's still there. Yeah. I w I'm wondering if they have some weird spam bots. Because every time I – forget the political implications of deleting this content. I've heard this complaint over and over and over for the last th three years. Because remember, when I, when I broke the terms of service, I got kicked off for 24 hours. And so I, I, I've become a – place to complain about you know getting your your they're site not gonna mess up. with your site robert that's a no, little they did. too they deleted obvious me for 24 hours and it, later i found out it was an automatic bot that deleted me based on the behavior i was uh, exhibiting and i i wonder if that's what's going on here is somebody's copy and pasting a, the url or a same kind of text and they're thinking it's spam because every time i ask a facebook staffer about this they always they always come back and go yeah, it sort of sucks that we don't have a, a, a good way to get back on the system for normal people, but we have no spam, right? You know, our system has no spam like other systems. And it's like, well, go ahead. It's like saying, you know, we built this system that works incredibly well, but fails very badly, right? Like our car goes zero to 60 in three seconds, but has no brakes. I mean, but it does go fast. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not like, it's not like, you know, God handed them two stone tablets that said, thou shalt make a spam filter without a circuit breaker. Uh, you know, someone sat down and said, oh, yeah, spam filter with a circuit breaker would cost more, be more uh, difficult to administer. Let's leave that out. Um, you know, I, it's, I it's, understand it's, there's a problem, though, when you have nearly half a billion users. I don't know how you do anything effectively. 
including censorship. Well, maybe they don't do it effectively. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so... Well, the, the so problem I want to go is back to what you were saying earlier about Facebook and how they lost their trust, because there's something else that Facebook did, which is that they had a plebiscite of their users, right? They said to their users, what, you know, you, you provide all the value here. What do you think Facebook's privacy policy, policy should be? What are you opting into when you opt into Facebook? And they let their users vote. And the users voted overwhelmingly for a much more private system than the one that they've just created. So, you know, I think that if, if you want to talk about losing trust, to me, that's the real trust loser yeah and I, it, all these issues i don't think have much to do with privacy because i i'm seeing us give up our privacy in a whole range of contexts outside so i think it's a trust issue and and that's why I, I why i wrote zuckerberg i said you know what you're deleting sites that's a trust issue it, it, i don't feel good about leaving my content on facebook i don't i don't believe you're gonna uh, treat it properly in the future. Well, you, you might delete my my identity or my business or my content, my pictures, and you've done that before. So you've already uh, told me that you're not trustworthy, and uh, you know that's what I want to hear. It, you know, it, the privacy stuff is points to trust. Does can we trust this company with our data? So that's the question, and and I guess what I'm saying to people is. Just this is these are all data points that were, are going to help inform your decision about whether you want to be on Facebook or not. But one thing's very clear: uh, if w I think this this comes down to the conversation about an open web, and it's much it's much better to have your presence on the web be something you control. Yeah. Uh, it, look, let's face it: people don't go to Facebook to search for people; they search on Google and then get their Facebook page. Yes or no? Uh, I disagree. Uh, I, I you actually, think people go to go to Facebook and search. Brian Chen uh, just tweeted that any journalist who quits Facebook is sacrificing access to a valuable resource for finding That's leads. That's BS. That's BS. Um, That's wrong. I disagree. I I have a lot of people in my Facebook who are professional, who are CEOs or CTOs or executives who put their phone number in Facebook and email addresses in Facebook. And and even if they don't, they answer their direct messages. It's hard to get a hold of some of these people. And so I, I understand where Brian's coming from there. I, I do use it on my iPhone to find phone numbers of my friends. Well, I would say then to people, if, you, if you're, if you wait, and by the way, this happens with Twitter too. There's Kevin Marks. The only way I can reach Kevin Marks is by DMing him on Twitter. That's wrong. I mean, that's just wrong. You know, if you, if you have to use Facebook to reach somebody, then better not reach them. If you have to use Twitter to reach somebody, then just, you know, I, I just, this is what I'm saying. You need an open web. Can't be reached. Well, yeah. I just don't believe the CEO of a company can't be reached without Facebook. I, I don't use Facebook. I've never really used Facebook. I've never had any trouble no, just, reaching people that I wanted to interview. It just makes the friction of finding their phone number a lot lower. That's all. Yeah, but are you saying they, they that don't if you call the PR office of any major corporation and say, hi, you know, I'm writing a story for The Guardian and I want to comment from you, uh, from your CTO about this, that they won't get back to you very quickly? I Absolutely. Mean, if, if they, they probably will, but there's a little friction. When, I, when I'm on my iPhone and calling people, you know, when Facebook bought FriendFeed, in fact, I had the two guys who own FriendFeed on my on. I know, on we couldn't Facebook, get them on. And I just clicked on their on their phone number, and I had the first interview because I just clicked on their phone number and got their phone, yeah. and said, "Hey, can we uh, talk? You know, in in a public forum about this?" And I was walking around the Alamo when that all happened. By the way, but did so they talk on the public forum with you right then, or yeah, did you then the set up an appointment? No, I recorded the call. I said, "Can can oh, you we?" Uh, the call. That's cool. That was back when Paul and Brett were much more open. I mean, I, you can't get them now. Right. You couldn't get that that kind of access now, probably. No, but because they have to check. With they have to you. go you through can't Facebook. Get them. They just they just say I can't talk on the record, right? Uh, until you get the PR people to exactly. prove me to talk. That was to you, that you was, they had just joined the company. They were they were they were still a little open, and we never did well, get them because we didn't use those methods. But I would submit that if you want to, I mean, I don't know if that's a reason to stay on Facebook. Maybe it is. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying that it's not hideously useful. That's why I am saying that. On I'm saying hand, what, you know, what uh, at what Omaha, price? I, I interviewed a lot of a lot of people who are not in the tech world, and they just love it for being able to contact their friends and family. I know. My wife, when I in interviewed her about this, she said, "I really don't care about the privacy as long as my as long as something doesn't leak exactly. out. And it, it hasn't yet." Um, 
but she said, I love being able to talk to my elementary school friends from, uh, you know, from Tehran that she grew up with. They're, she said they're all on Facebook. She said there's several of them. That's the only place she could find I them. Know. She went to Google and Yahoo and tried to search for them and couldn't find them, but she found them instantly on Facebook. Abby's a freshman in college uh, this fall, and the, all the incoming freshmen have created a, a Facebook group where they're meeting each other before they go. I'm not saying it's not useful. In fact, very often... The most horrendous mm -hmm. things are useful. I'm just saying, it's interesting. what's the price? It's interesting the degree to which this reverses the traditional dynamic for people like us who are using Facebook, presumably for uh, like to have a public profile, as opposed to people who are just using it to find their friends. So traditionally, like if you had a service or a magazine or a media outlet that you use to kind of communicate with the rest of the world, the more uh, important you were, uh, the more they would rely on you. So in other words, if you know, if, if you if you just talk to People Magazine and People Magazine, people buy People Magazine to see what you have to say every month, um, you have more leverage over People Magazine the more people you have who care about you. Uh, it's the opposite with Facebook. With Facebook, the more people there are who care about you, the less you can afford to leave Facebook because of that walled garden nature, because it's much harder for them to follow you somewhere else. Uh, it's a little like what happens with DRM and publishing, where the more, uh, as a publisher... If you know if all of your music is sold through one DRM platform, all your video, all of your audiobooks, all your books are sold through one DRM platform, uh, leaving that DRM platform becomes much more expensive for you because you have to count on your your listeners or your readers or your viewers following you to a new new platform, and that means that they have to abandon the old platform. They can't take the media of yours that they right. bought with them. Um, Mark did send you an email saying that this week. Facebook, they've been listening, they've been planning, they've been thinking, and they're going to do, they're going to make a shift, right, Robert, this week? Yeah. He, he said basically that um, uh, he wanted to wait until they had actually software fixes for some of the problems that they, that they've been seeing people talk about and that they just didn't want to talk and not have anything to show, which is a legitimate way to come at it. I, I think he did a, himself a bunch of brand damage by not, you know, coming out earlier, but, you know. Uh, they'll survive in a year. Uh, you know, if they if they make some good sh choices from here, and and win our trust back, and and stop doing some of the stuff that they've been doing to uh, shift stuff that we thought was private into the public sphere without our permission, um, then I I think uh, you know they'll get, regain trust. I, I don't think that's why they'll survive. They'll survive because there's no good alternative. I think MySpace fell apart for far less uh, because Facebook existed. And if there existed a good alternative to Facebook now that were private and trustworthy, people would go there and that would be it. Facebook would be over. Uh, the, so, so there are it's, it's other a, systems like Pipio. Wall Street Journal, I think. Pipio is not an alternative to Facebook. I like Pipio. Because nobody's on it. Well, yeah, it's kind of circular, though, isn't it? I know there's the yeah. network effect, but uh, Remember, Facebook, you Facebook get started. Remember, you tried to move to Jaiku. Yeah, and Facebook started at zero. Things can start at zero. Something does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you saying Facebook's here forever, no matter what? I. I, I don't never's a long time. <laughs> five years. I I can't see a, a scenario where it falls apart in the next five years. I just so don't. Scubble, it's it sounds kind of like you're saying that the reason that they're giving out your personal information, like they changed their privacy policy to give out personal information that they previously said they wouldn't, is because they had a technical error and they don't want to say anything about it until they fix the technical error. No, I, I think the, there's a couple different problems that they're working on. Uh, and let's separate them out into the pieces. One is they keep changing their privacy uh, policies so often that you can't even keep track of what the ch policies were or what changed. Mm -hmm. You know, it, even my wife uh, said that, you know, I get a, a message, you know, she got a message two two months ago that the policies had changed and then at F8, it, they changed again. And and that causes a lot of people just to be confused, like, why are they changing this so much? There's too much change about something that's so um, emotional about for people. So that's one, mm. that's one slice. The other slice is actually what they did, which at the F8 conference, which is they took stuff that used to be uh, that you used to be able to keep private. For instance, your social graph and some of mm -hmm. your uh, profile information, like what music you listen to and what mo movies you like listening to or going to and, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And they took that and made that public as well. And then they also added a new feature or a new set of features, a new API and, and a new privacy construct where 
applications now could share that information with each other. For instance, I, I got the new Pandora that night, and wow, all my friends were there on Pandora with all of their mm -hmm. music. <laughs> and so I could see, oh, Leo Laporte listens to Black Eyed Peas or, you know, or, you know, or Dana Boyd listens to this thing. And, and my boss was listening to, uh, you know, Kenny G and I made fun of him in a blog post. You know? <laughs> and that was unexpected. So those three separate buckets of things are all going at one time. And, and so that caused the firestorm and the media frenzy around this. So I guess the thing that I'm skeptical of is that they couldn't have said something about the privacy policy change because it caught them off guard. I mean, I don't understand how something that you do can catch you off guard, right? No one surprised them by changing their privacy policy. No, the they reaction the policy. reaction is what surprised them, not Well, the... yeah, but presumably, like, they knew what they were doing when they did it because they had this website last year in which right. their users said, don't do this, and then they did it, and then their users were upset to say, oh, we had no idea, and we can't say anything for a while until we figure this all out. Just sounds to me to be like a kind of lame excuse. And in so, terms of the privacy, sorry, I'm about the sorry. music there. Go, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I stole Pandora. Policy, <laughs> being being so complicated, you yeah. know. I, I reviewed this book on Boing Boing uh, back in 2007 called How to Cheat at Everything by Simon Lovell, which it's actually a book about how not to be cheated. But one of the things he talks about is how how um, proposition bets work, like um, you know, double or nothing if this happens, uh, triple if that happens, and so on. And he basically is is can boil it down it's like anytime someone makes a proposition to you that's really complicated the reason that they made it that complicated is to make it hard for you to figure out what the odds are and anytime yeah. someone presents you with a bunch of privacy options that are incredibly complicated i think the reason that they do that is to make it hard for you to figure out what you're agreeing to some of the yeah some of this argument comes down to uh, trying to understand their intent and of course uh, some of us impute their intent to be not so nice and some of us say oh like you robert say well you know they're trying and the and, 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 and I don't know, do we need to know their intent to know whether we want to be part of Facebook? I, it seems to me that what's happened is sufficient, whether their intent is good or ill, what's happened is sufficient for me to say I don't really want to be there because I can't trust them to do the right thing, whether intentionally or not. And yeah. I'm also really seriously concerned about this open graph, this open this social graph thing they're doing, because it really strikes me they're trying to co-opt the web. They would oh, love... they absolutely are. I, yeah. I wrote the post I wrote that night after F8 wasn't even focused so much on privacy because I, I don't think we had time to even think about it then. But I said, man, these are ambitious moves. And everybody at the press conference was using words like scary and ambitious. And, and off camera, they would make fun of it. They would say, man, Zuckerberg has balls. He's going for it all. You know? right. And they would joke around like that. Yeah, he, uh, he's, I, he's, he's, it's a, it seemed to me a grab. And again, I don't know what the intent was, but I don't think I need to know what the intent was. Well, I don't the, think it's, it's good for the internet. The intent is, he, he you know, clearly uh, Facebook is headed, is headed toward an IPO. And to get to an IPO and, and maximize the profit there, they have to turn on a new kind of advertising that's beyond banner advertising because we're I'm not paying attention to any banner ads. Right. I, I couldn't tell you the last time I've even paid attention to any ads on the side of Facebook or anywhere really. So where is the future money in advertising? And I think Google showed us where it is. It's in search. It's search. in yeah. telling people or asking the system, show me all the restaurants in Half Moon Bay. And then uh, having an offer in there. Uh, face, uh, Foursquare is showing us offers now. It's really interesting. Um, and I think that's where the money is, and Zuckerberg knows that's where the money is and needs to push his company in that direction, which means get out of a private system because he's not going to be able to make any money there. That's where the and fundamental problem is. People join Facebook with one promise, that I was gonna, I can post stuff here and it's going to stay private and I control who gets to see it. And all Facebook really would need to do is to make it that way, to make it an opt-out or opt-in situation where it's private unless you say otherwise. That would yeah. solve a lot of people's issues, but it would not solve their ultimate corporate, I agree with you, Robert, their ultimate corporate goal. And they've taken this chance, and it's a big chance. They know what they're doing. They've taken a very large... Sorry. <laughs> when I plug my phone, my phone battery is dying. When I plug it in, it makes that horrible noise. Go ahead. <laughs> I love it. They're taking a very large chance. Uh, and this is, they know they're going to get flack. This is the flack. And what they're hoping is that their almost 500 million users will insulate, and the network effect will insulate them against that flack. They'll be able to make this very big sea change in privacy and survive it on the other end. Maybe, maybe depleted, but not bowed. 
and continue on. I, I've actually, you know, I, it's, it's funny because I've gone the other way. I've actually used Facebook more in the past couple of weeks because of things like the Pandora. <laughs> I, I can't look at Facebook now. It just makes me queasy. I'm sorry. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't miss it. I don't miss it. I have to say. Go ahead, Corey. I, I'd, I'd be uh, interested in knowing w w the how many users Facebook actually has, because we all know what the user game looks like, right? 500 million people at some point had a Facebook account is not the same thing as there are 500 million people who are active Facebook users. Well, they claim no, active. They're very specific when they, they say active. Numbers. They're, they're very specific. What does active about mean? When Used they in the last numbers. month, I think is what they're saying, yeah, right, Robert? people who have signed in in the past month, they actually have many times more than 500 million people who have signed into the system and left it or just left their their account life out. But does signed in just mean that um they've they've uh that they've got a cookie or does signed and that 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 hits some advertising, you know, I don't know because that's that's web? an interesting question because of the likes and and things that are spraying now out over mm -hmm. the web. Uh, mm -hmm. but these numbers were before likes came out. So uh um, well, they've got 500 million. Yeah. It's, it's just I, those numbers, I, whenever I hear giant numbers, uh, you know, I, I'm always reminded, I think it was Kevin Marks said uh, uh, a giant number, an imaginary number multiplied by a giant number is always a very big number. I, I know I was in Tel Aviv after F8 and people there are very excited about Facebook. They were wearing the Facebook like buttons at conferences and handing them out as stickers and stuff. Um, there's a lot of people on Facebook, whether mm -hmm. it's 400 million or 200 million or you know, mm. there's a lot of people who are on Facebook that aren't on other things. It's pretty obvious that, that there's a lot of people. I don't know how many a mm. lot is. Sure. It's pretty obvious. And and that in itself scares me because I think more and more people, just like AOL, are seeing Facebook as the web. The, just mm -hmm. as they used to see AOL as the Internet, now they're seeing Facebook as the Internet. And that's, to me, this is, a, this is retro, retrograde. This is a regression to an older walled garden model of the Internet that I don't want to see. Well, it's it's a weird it's a weird walled garden though it, it, you know uh, answers.com for instance which is the 18th largest website put the like buttons all on every answer and um, that's not the old AOL like gar walled garden where you had to pay to get into the walled garden but it's a new kind of walled garden that I think we're still wrapping our heads around it's it, it's not like AOL it's something new which is fascinating yeah. I want to move on a little bit. Any final thoughts before we go to the next topic, which is Google I.O.? Corey, uh, bottom line I'm it good. for us. You're good? <laughs> I'm, good. I'm good, he says. I'm, I'm good. good. You know, it's enough. funny because I'm not a Facebook user, so I wasn't a Facebook user before. I'm, I'm especially not a Facebook user now, but uh, it's not, It's you know, I, I, I kind of looked at this and I went, hey, look, someone invented a Skinner box to teach you how to undervalue your privacy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and 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 ran away. So I, I I'm not you know I, I I don't have a very nuanced view of it. I'm afraid because I didn't spend a lot of time there. But I I am very skeptical of the idea that you can't do work as a journalist without Facebook. I, I hope not. I guess if you're like freaked out about getting scoops, which I've never actually seen the point of, uh, then maybe. But um, you know I've been I've been a print journalist and a web journalist now for more than half my life, and uh, you know I've never used Facebook for it. So. Yeah, for luckily for our industry, uh, Twitter has gotten become predominant. I don't trust uh, them either. By the way, I just want to make well, it. yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're very willing to stab you in the back when they're when you're not looking. I, I you know, it's funny. I, I do trust Ev more than I than I trust Mark, and mostly it's because I mean, it's it, Twitter was never private in any respect. You know, I mean, I guess you could have a sure. private Twitter account, but nobody who uses Twitter really. Well, DMs are private, right? If you took all of our DMs and put them in public sphere. I always, I always treated Twitter as an absolutely public place. And so what's the risk? What's the harm? You know what you're doing when you're on Twitter. And that's the issue for me is that Facebook made it the opposite promise initially. Yeah. We'll talk more in just a bit. I am very excited about uh, some of the announcements from Google. Robert, you were there at Google I.O. this week, and we'll talk about that. And you got your new Evo phone. Yeah. Well, you got a good deal because for $400 to go to that conference, you get a, a Motorola Droid. And then they surprise you at the keynote and give everybody I a, a Evo as well. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Actually, it was a Nexus One that they handed out. So they handed uh, the attendees two phones, and the press people only got one. So, <laughs> but I already had. I can't use a T-Mobile phone, so I didn't want. I the love. Nexus oh, you're in Half Moon Bay. There's no T-Mobile. No T-Mobile in my house. Oh, that's so too bad. sorry. <laughs> I, I love my Nexus One. I have to say, it's a wonderful. Me phone. too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. And have you put Froyo on it uh, yet? The two point two, Corey. 
No, I'm not doing any OS upgrades while I'm on a book tour. Uh, I guess you're I right. That that's like <laughs> that is just asking the fates to come along and just kick what? your ass. So what? I'm one version of Ubuntu back. I'm one version of Android back. Uh, oh, you're gonna back you're gonna YouTube. love Lucid Links. I think they really hit the ball out of the yeah. park. Yeah, 10.04 is just really slick. I, oh. I can never remember what the what the acronym is. You know, I always know that it goes up by one letter, so it's some uh, so L -L. It starts with an L. L, -L. It starts with an L. Right. And I've been calling it like leap and lizards. I know, me long. too. <laughs> I can't yeah. remember either. I know it's some animal and it's some adjective. That's all. I know. Crazy kangaroo. And, <laughs> yeah. Hey, let me briefly talk about our friends at Citrix and the great product. Go to meeting, and then we're going to get on with the show. You know, we figured out a way to survive uh, on advertising. It's just forcing you to listen to it as we go through the show. Just just listen. It's okay. Let it wash over you. And this might be a good time if, uh, you know, you want to get a snack or whatever because I have a feeling we've got a lot to talk I'm gonna about. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. There you go. Exactly. That's the, that's what this is all about. Go to the bathroom right now and while I talk about go to meeting. Go to meeting. See, go to meeting is is so great because you can do things like, you know, not wear any pants the next time you're at a business meeting. You can <laughs> because go to meeting makes it possible to meet over the phone. You're having a conference call but some to make it visual. Robert, you could use this for I think for some of your interviews. We use it now more and more on the shows as people can show stuff. Um I just love it. Whenever somebody wants to have a meeting, I say let's have a go to meeting instead. And I want you to try it free for 30 days right now. Go to go to meeting.com slash twit. You can you can you can meet with the people you want to work with, whether they're across town or across the country, even around the world. Bring them closer together. Collaborate, demonstrate, train, present. It includes VoIP. The new iPad. I'm not going to say this while Corey's not around. The new iPad app is so slick. I know he's not an iPad fan. The it is so slick. You could I took it out in the backyard with Wi-Fi. It's got a microphone, the audio. Oh, here he comes. I won't mention that. Don't say the I. Go to meeting.com. Brought to you by Citrix. Try it today for 30 days absolutely free. Go to meeting.com slash twit. We thank them for their support of uh, This Week in Tech. I was just saying. I'm good for the next half hour. Good. <laughs> no more tea. I was just saying, you wrote an article, Why I Won't Buy an iPad. This was in January. And why you shouldn't either. Have you changed your tune, Corey Doctorow? No. You know, I, I was, it was in April, actually. And uh, so... A lot of people, they said, well, you know, you, you've got all these points about the ecosystem of the iPad, but wait till you hold the gadget. It's an amazing gadget. And so I've held a couple. I've played with a couple. You know, people keep bringing them. Yeah, there you go. People keep bringing them to the... Um, to, to my signings and stuff, and I pick it up and I go, yes, this is a moderately well-assembled piece of, you know, South Chinese electronics. <laughs> Only for you, in, you know, 18 months, we'll look back on this and we'll go, wow, that looks really anachronistic, like those old toilet seat uh, iMacs. You so think so? Really? Open. Of course it will. I mean, this is Apple's special genius, really, is that they design a device that will be obsolete in 18 months and will be aesthetically obsolete in 18 months, so that you're, you know, you're... Just like you're Detroit. IMAC, it's like fin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You take your iPod out of the box and you look at it and you go, oh my God, this is the most futuristic device I've ever owned. You remember the first ones that were kind of the size of a of like a Dove bar? And and then after like uh, a year, you know, they come up with one that's half the size, that double the capacity and half the price. And you look at this thing and first of all, the, 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 the industrial finish is designed to be... Um, uh, kind of wear off pretty quickly. So, you know, the, the, you it know, we have look dull. Yeah, it looks dull. It gets all scratchy. You know, I just got this new, like, uh, tiny little Leatherman tool. You can carry one of these in your pocket for, like, two years, and they don't they don't uh, scratch at all, but somehow they can't figure out how to make the back of your iPod out of that. You know, you look at it cross-eyed, and it, it, it looks You're like... You're saying this is intentional. This is industrial design. Oh, I, I think so. I mean, designed obsolescence. Really when you dump it in the, in the garbage can a year later, two years later. Same reason, um, then, probably, that they don't let you change batteries. It just encourages you, after two years of charges... To own it for longer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so so I, I never had that aesthetic frisson, right, where I picked it up and I was like, oh, wow, this is the best design device ever. Uh, I picked it up and I was like, it's a it's a skinny big phone. Uh, I have a Nexus One. It's like if you took a Nexus One and made it a lot bigger, uh, you'd have one of these. Uh, and, it's, and, and, you know, there is no such thing as an iPad without its ecosystem. The, um, the iPad basically only exists to the extent that it's embedded in all these software services and, and subscriptions and so on. And so, you know, you can think of it as just like a physical extrusion of this big set of policies and, and commercial arrangements and so on. And those policies and commercial arrangements are actually a lot uglier than the device. 
And so given that we're going to throw the device away in a year and buy another device, and the only thing that's going to endure are the policies and the, un and the underpinnings, that's the thing that I think we should be paying attention to. And I just don't understand how anyone can defend it. I mean, is, is there anyone who really thinks that, like, there's a boiler room full of prudes big enough to evaluate everything that someone might want to deliver to your device and make good decisions about it? Like, Apparently, uh, Apple thinks so. <laughs> I mean, we, we've got even bo bigger boiler rooms full of prudes that try to figure out what, you know, web pages you should be able to look at in schools and libraries. And we all know how screwed up they are. And if you don't, True. just ask your kids. True. So, you know, uh, it, you know, human evaluation of stuff doesn't scale very well. And, you know, to the extent that it's like that that Apple wants to make sure that they've contained the experience, I don't understand how that's at odds with a checkbox that says, I'm a grown-up, let me choose something different. I mean, that's what my Android Steve Jobs' has. response to that is, well, you have a choice. You don't have to buy Apple products. We think that there's a, a group of consumers who will prefer that kind of control environment. Yeah, I totally agree. You shouldn't. You, it shouldn't be illegal to sell iPads. I think that you should just not buy an iPad because I think it's a bad idea. And one of the ways that people make decisions about whether or not to buy a device is people talk about it in public. You know, I've never said uh, we should have a law that, that prohibits making iPads. I've said uh, you should think about how the iPad works and, and all the stuff that's not obvious when you take it out of the box, like all that ecosystem stuff that's kind of hard to see and make your decision accordingly. I, I am in accord with Steve on this. I, I do have one small quibble with him, which is that um, by p adding just like a, a one atom thick layer of DRM to the iPad, you know, it wasn't good enough to stop someone from breaking the DRM. It was broken within 24 hours. They, they've basically gotten for themselves the legal right to stop you from breaking your iPad and installing other stuff on it. So, you know, my, my friend Joel Johnson wrote a response to that editorial where he said, you know, I can't hack my dishwasher either. I can't make stuff with my dishwasher. And someone tweeted later, you know, uh, I, can't, I, I can't hack my toaster. But no one ever designed a dishwasher where it was illegal to make dishes that fit in the dishwasher unless you had the manufacturer's permission. And no one ever designed a dishwasher where it was illegal to put those dishes in the dishwasher. No one ever designed a toaster where only one company got to make the bread for it. Um, Apple has done that, and we're not talking about something as trivial as, as toasters or bread. We're talking about, you know, culture and information and communications tools, which I think we should deal with, you know, treat with a lot more gravitas than, than bread or dishes. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. Uh, I happen to love my iPad, but, uh, you know, I also love other things that are bad for me, like, you know... Um, Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme donuts, exactly. Yeah, you're, uh, you're making bad decisions about something in the present where the consequences happen. Long-term long consequences, long much harder to yeah. see, and I've never been good at long-term consequences. However, I have to say, after watching the speeches at Google I.O. and playing with uh, the Evo and, uh, and taking a look... By the way, the Evo is just a little bit bigger... Then the Nexus One, and just even a little bit more size there makes it really good. You can read on it. Uh, you, I mean, I just, it's really, so I'm, I'm actually, in a way, I think that it's kind of uh, interesting to see we have these two groups now kind of fighting it out, Apple and Google, and, um, and, you, have, and you do have a choice. And I think there will be Android tablets that might have all the functionality of the iPad and then some. In fact, I talked to Sergey Brin at, at Google I.O., and he's very passionate about tablets and, and obviously has an iPad and is, is studying it very closely. But so just, I before I go, just before I go down that road, Corey, do, okay. you, do you have any problems with Google? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. So I, I started off, you know, like I think a lot of us, I was very enthusiastic about Google when it was like two guys at Stanford and some computers built out of Lego under a desk, right? And we were all like, wow, they're running Linux and they're doing something that's so much better than Alta Vista and it's great. And then I got very enthusiastic for them when they started to do really well. And then I started to feel kind of ambivalent about them when they, when, you know, they started to go down DRM and privacy violating roads. And then I started to feel really kind of hostile to them when they started emitting this really self-serving BS about, you know, oh, we've gone into China, we're censoring results, but that's only because getting results that the Politburo didn't want you to see would be a bad user experience, which is like the most <laughs> crazy thing I ever heard anyone say. Um, and and n then I went back to kind of ambivalent about them, and now I'm feeling pretty enthusiastic about them. Between 100 gigabit Ethernet or gigabit Ethernet uh, through in towns, gigabit uh, municipal broadband, um, totally like messing up the the little cartelism of the of the phone companies and um, Android with Android and with the G1 and and just kind of generally pursuing an open and neutral net 
more or less, uh, and standing up to bullies like Viacom with YouTube, I feel like they're being a force for good these days. I'm pretty happy about it. Uh, the China thing was really interesting because I talked to a lot of really senior Googlers I knew uh, about about China, and um, they said, yeah, you know that story you've heard about like Sergey Brin rolling in a bed one morning and going, oh my God, my company is being used to like help have, you know arrest dissidents and harvest their organs for par party members. I can't do that anymore. We're just not wow, going to do that's that anymore. Great. Uh, yeah. You know, you and, think that's and true. they all say it's true. They yeah. all say, and and you know, either either he's he's really good at duping his employees, or it's true, which would be pretty cool. I have to say, I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of the uh, Android operating system. I think they made some big announcements there. It's interesting, isn't it, that the that uh, Vic Condotra, uh, Condotra, never Condotra. Mind, Condotra, who made the uh, both, but did both did very well. I think on both keynotes, despite some real technical uh, issues uh, especially in the second keynote really took some pot shots at apple in the uh, second on the, mm. on the, the thursday keynote it was very clear that a lot of what the droid uh, the android 2.2 release was about was fighting back and and, and made a big deal about flash availability i'm not sure that that's exactly something i go crazy uh, over uh, yes you can run flash now on your nexus one uh, although well, thanks to apple you don't see a lot of sites mobile sites with with, with flash on it anymore yeah, well, with Vic, he he uses every sword that he, uh, somebody hands him. Um, I I thought he was channeling Corey actually on stage. Really, <laughs> he did a good job, and it was it was it was exciting. I think what what the the roadmap for Android looks very exciting. Mm. So yeah, you know, free software often goes down like on a, a slow code path uh, is something Danny O'Brien coined. Uh, you know, they, it's, it's what, um, it's what happened with, with Mozilla where, you know, there was a lot of hype and then nothing happened for a long time. And then all of a sudden, bam, there was this amazing world-class right. browser that just right. kind of seemed to appear. From I, I remember even oh. saying what happened to the Mozilla project Did Netscape open sourced yeah, it and exactly. nothing, you know, yeah, Jamie you know, Zawinski no, went and opened a nightclub. It's all over. Yeah. So I, I have a theory kind of about all of this stuff, about mobile content and about tablets and so on, is that um, anything where there's an enormous amount of hope and hype about what a device or a technology means for the future of an industry, it's very hard to do iterative, fast smart development. Um, so, you know, here's what I mean by iterative, fast, smart development. Um, I, when I was dating the woman who's now my wife, Alice, uh, I was on the uh, board of a company called um, uh, Ludicorp, uh, the advisory board, and they made a little flash game that was really fun. Alice lived in London. I lived in San Francisco. We had this long distance relationship. And one day the founder of Ludicorp came over to my place in San Francisco and said, how's it going with Alice? And I said, you know, uh, it's going great. And we share these photos of our days as we go through the day, but it's a pain to do it. And he said, oh, we've got photo sharing coming in the game. We'll, we'll accelerate that feature. And people really liked it. So they were revving the game a lot, like every 30 minutes. And eventually that feature grew to eclipse the game and they retitled the service Flickr. Yeah. Right. That's what iteration looks like. You know, a user has an idea. You do a lot of stuff. Something happens. And no one's looking over your shoulder going, are you sure that's a good idea? You know, maybe we should have a meeting. Let's have some business development before that happens. Meanwhile, if you try to do anything with, say, ebooks at a publishing house, as soon as you, like, whisper the word ebook anywhere in the building, everybody runs up and tries to make sure that whatever it is that you do, since it's it's definitely going to be the future of the company because it's ebooks. Whatever it is you do isn't going to uh, undermine their little corner of the, the publishing empire. And that means that you spend six months in meetings making sure you don't offend anyone and you produce something that's ultimately really inoffensive. And when nobody likes it, you can't produce something different the next day because you've got to get everyone to buy in again. And as a result, all the mobile content offerings I've seen, you know, with, with like for some values of all, have just been crap. And all the, um, all the tablet stuff has been really slow moving and not very interesting. You know, nobody wants to take big risks in case the risk that they take costs them the business. Well, if something like uh, Android is open and freely available, doesn't that encourage, you know, some interesting hardware stuff? Yeah, totally. And that's that's what I think we've got, you know, with without without if you don't have to worry about what happens when you ship apart from whether people like it or not, not whether, you know, some company will approve of it, then you've got a lot fewer steps to making a, uh, a revision and another revision and another revision. It lets you go really quickly. Um, and so I, I, that's what I hope will happen with Android is that people will be able to be more nimble with their technology offerings. Corey? Corey, the place that I uh, really was excited was the video codec, the M8. Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to talk about uh, M uh, WebM, 
which Web, v I'm VBA sorry, and uh, and a, a digital TV too in just a second because there was a lot from Google uh, this week a lot to a lot to digest in fact so much that uh, some of it was leaking out from Google in the blogs and so forth before they even made it to the keynote and some of it never even made it to the keynote so this was a big week for Google we'll also uh, we've got our lightning round coming up and uh, including a twenty three thousand member reply all email. <laughs> <laughs> Just one more reason you don't want to do a reply all. Before we do that, though, you may, Corey, if you wish, find a, find a, a place to go to the bathroom. Anything you'd like to do right now, Robert, go right ahead. As I they used know. to say, the smoking lamp is on. Smoke them if you've got them. I got, You're going to go look at the room service menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do that. Your check code just asked, what is this monitor? It's an Apple 24-inch monitor. On its on side. Ergotron arm, and you can turn it left yeah. or right. And the Mac OS X uh, software lets you... Go vertical or horizontal. So. so you have on one computer you have a, hor a, a horizontal landscape and a portrait yep. display. So you put yeah. the web pages on the portrait display and the and the spreadsheets on the. Or the yeah, video this is just a twenty-seven inch iMac good. with a twenty-four inch monitor nice. on its side. Nice. Setup. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. How are you backing that up? Um, all over the internet. <laughs> the reason I ask, Carbonite has a, a great solution for Macs. Now, this is not for Macs. This is the business solution, and Windows only right now, but it is it is backed by the same great Carbonite service. It's Carbonite Pro for small business. You've heard me talk about Carbonite over the years. Uh, the, the service that backs up your PC or Mac files remotely, automatically, encrypted, so that if you're in a disaster mode, forest, fire, flood, earthquake, tornado, and you've lost your backups locally, you, you are not down for the count. I'm going to put Carbonite on my daughter's laptop before she goes to college this fall, of course. But what about business? Carbonite found out a lot of business users were using the consumer-grade Carbonite because there wasn't anything similar for a small business. Well, now there is Carbonite Pro. I want you to try Carbonite Pro for free for 30 days. Just go to CarbonitePro.com. You'll be very impressed. A central dashboard that lets you back up your entire enterprise. Your users can restore themselves. You don't have to. They don't have to come begging you for their old files. You do get a status report on all the backups. You're able to restore as you as you choose yourself. Prices start as low as ten dollars a month, and I'll give you an example. If you have eight computers, five gigabytes of backup, twenty-five bucks a month. That's all. 10 computers with 5 gigs, $50 a month. That's 10 to $50 a month for peace of mind for you and your employees. Your files are safe, encrypted, off-site at a sophisticated data centers. Carbonite's just great. I used them. I have used them for a long time now, and I encourage you to do the same. Whether it's Carbonite for your home or Carbonite Pro for your business, try Carbonite Pro free right now. CarbonitePro.com. We thank them so much for their support of the entire Twit network. And I do make it my motto, back up. You got to back up to get it back. Somebody in our uh, in our audience has a uh, Evo here. I can't wait. I'm really excited about this. The only negative, though, I'm a little disappointed. You can't put 2.2 on it because it's got that Sprint's. The, I mean, sorry, the uh, HTC uh, uh, Sense UI on top of it. So they have to upgrade that. Robert, do you like the Sense UI? Yeah. As opposed to just like the Nexus one. Um. Vanilla Droid. Yeah, I, I, it doesn't bother me too much. It was pretty, pretty similar in most, most of the yeah, places. There's some elegant that stuff to... that looks nice. And Corey, what is that? It's Canine that you recommend as an email tool on the on the Android operating system. Is it? Oh wait, a minute, I've turned yeah. you down. Go ahead, Canine. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yeah, I turned you down. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Canine's like an industrial strength fork of the uh, mailer that comes with. Um, that comes with Android. It's a pretty good pop client. Uh, I, I always use pop. I just wanted to say I'm with you on this backup stuff. Uh, I'm not a, uh, I don't use uh, Carbonite because I'm not a Windows user, but um, I've been a backup, you know, the backup guy for all my life. Uh, uh, always been telling other people to back I've, up. And, Corey, I've seen what you do to your laptops. <laughs> I'm not oh, surprised. Yeah, sure. I'll never you know, forget. As a guy who kills a laptop or two a year, although I tell you what, these ThinkPads are so rugged relative to the hardware I used to use. I used to use a lot of Mac laptops. And the ThinkPads are super rugged and come with one year or one to three years of on-site next day worldwide hardware replacement, which is great. I, I, I'm not, no one's paying me from, from ThinkPad to do this, but for like a hundred bucks a year, someone will come to your hotel room anywhere in the world the next day with hardware to fix it. But even so, I'm a total backup guy. I, I have an onsite, I have an offsite, I have a travel backup, I have a, you know, a cloud backup. Well, you're and a I, novelist. I mean, somebody, somebody who writes fiction, uh, you know, um, 
I remember, um, you know, the Oakland fires of about was about 15 years ago, something like that. And um, uh, a novelist, who was it? Was it Amy Tan? Some, some well-known novelist lost not only her house in the fire, but lost her manuscripts in the fire. Oh, my gosh. And, I mean, there's nothing worse. You know, Ralph Ellison, after, after he lost his manuscript, he never wrote another novel. And, wow. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you don't want to, if you're writing something, you don't want to. In fact, if I would, you, I were you, I'd print it and mail it <laughs> to somebody. To <laughs> every chapter. Well, you know, I SCP it to my server in Toronto, uh, all my working files. But, but you know, I also use um, uh, Git to back really? up my writing as I go. For revisions. Um, wow. For revisions. And my, you know, there's a, a friend of mine, Thomas Gideon, who's got a great podcast called The Command Line, uh, does... Um, uh, wrote me some Python scripts called Flashbake that uh, every 15 minutes take all of my working files, checks to see if there's been any updates, checks them into a local Git repository, which is like a version control thing software guys use, software programmers use, and then um, adds for context the last three songs I've played, the last three <laughs> headlines I've posted to Boing Boing, <laughs> time zone, weather, you know, how long it's been since I rebooted, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, so and, you have a record of your life kind of almost in that Git yeah, repository. Yeah, it's really cool. And this is for me, like, to get back to, to Facebook Book, which we shouldn't go back to, but it's the difference between spyware and myware. It's the difference between like a pedometer and like, you know, your boss counting how many steps you take in a day to figure out if you're going to the bathroom too often. I love having this stuff for myself. And my plan is since Git is so good at replicating itself, my, my plan is to put a Git um, uh, install on my server, uh, which is in a big cage in Toronto at 151 Front Street, and then just have the two stay in sync. What a good idea. Yeah, because every Git repository is a duplicate. Unlike SVN, uh, where there's one repository, you have everything everywhere, right, on Git? Mm -hmm. I think so. I yeah, think I that's think right. that's the idea behind it. Uh, wow, that's cool. Is that code available? Because I would, I think that's a yeah, great idea. It's GPL'd. Uh, it's, on, it's on GitHub. It's called Flash Bake, which is a term from my, uh, my, my first novel from Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom. Right. Flash Bake. Wow. Uh, and it's great. Works works like a charm. That is it's, really uh, cool. It's extensible and open. Yeah. So so it's basically I could have it save everything I do. Uh, you know any, any changes, all the text. What a, what a it's a great thing about working in a text file. Yep. Text is text is nice that way. Wow, mm. that's really cool. Uh, oh, I was showing you the wrong thing. I have it set up wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> I was wondering. Ask Corey something something. No, something, I was going to ask Corey. It says, right "Ask Corey." You want to know what it says? Ask Corey <laughs> about his rec recent unusual Skype interview. Oh, God. What, you did a naked Skype interview? Accidentally, my friend Alex Kratowski, writing me up for The Guardian, had a phoner with me at 6 a.m. when I was in San Francisco. I was rushing to get dressed because I had a uh, like a 6.40 call to get to the first school for first period down the peninsula. And I forgot Skype cam was on. So I answered the phone naked from the waist up. And she said, oh, my God, you're naked. And she's a good friend of ours. It wasn't like it wasn't terrible. Right. I was just naked from the waist up. It was OK. So I dived under the table. I turned the camera off and I walked around with the laptop for like 10 minutes getting dressed <laughs> and then i sat back down again and the camera was still on i said alex is, is the camera been on the whole time she said oh i didn't want to embarrass you so it was it was definitely a low point that, that i've had two kind of major malapropisms on this tour that were very funny in hindsight so that was the first one the second one is a guy came up to my signing oh god i don't even remember what city i was in maybe it was austin and he said uh uh, can you, um, I, I said, like, what would you like in your book? And he said, uh, Drama Hobbit. And I said, a Drama Hobbit? And he said, yeah, Drama Hobbit, Drama Hobbit. So I drew the most dramatic Hobbit I could. And he said, no, Draw Muhammad. <laughs> this is Muhammad the Hobbit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I drew a very dramatic Hobbit and possibly gave offense to uh, like a quarter of the world's population at the same time. All the Hobbits, all the little people now are upset with you, Corey. There's a fat All law. the little Hobbits, all the little Hobbits. <laughs> Is it me? That's a meme going on right now, though, isn't it? Draw, draw Muhammad meme kind of going around. Yeah, it's unfortunately kind of intertangles issues of free speech with xenophobia. It's kind of hard. I I know what you mean. It's like, yeah. I, and I also don't want to. Well, anyway, I I don't want to go there. I, it's not not for fear, but I don't. It's it's somebody's beliefs. I don't I don't I don't want to kind of mingle that in with. Well, I'm okay with ridiculing um, dumb beliefs, but I just. Um, uh, I just, uh, you know, I, I think that, that 
there's a difference between saying I think your beliefs are dumb and saying I think you're a bad person right. and saying I'm going to intentionally give offense to a whole bunch of people over something else. And I just I think that it's it, unfortunately it's one of those things like if you want to do an experiment, you always want to isolate out the thing you're trying to prove or test. And when you're doing like a social experiment, it's really nice to make it fairly un, un, uh, fairly unambiguous so that it doesn't look right. like a racist attack on a group right. of people on the basis of their ethnicity right. and instead looks like a defense of free speech. And unfortunately, it kind of, it's smack in the middle of those things. Right. And it's on Facebook, just to, just to conf confuse the whole thing. Here's, here's the GitHub uh, <laughs> command line flashbake. Uh, yeah. Yep. Very cool. Yeah, I'm going to try that. It's called the command line. The command line. I've got to try that. That's really, really neat. So uh, Google TV, now, Corey, you're probably not interested in Google TV because this really does look like a commercial enterprise uh, from Google. They're doing a deal. Sony, Logitech, and the Dish Networks all will in add this uh, capability to hardware. Sony will put it in their TVs. Logitech's going to make a little box. Dish is going to put it in their satellite dish. We're, I was underwhelmed by this. Robert, you were there. Did it seem more exciting to you than it did to me? It seemed like it was kind of pathetic. Uh, I, well, you know, if, if you come from the geek world and you have a media center <laughs> hooked up to your yeah. TV and you have we've been able to do this Apple for a TV, long time. And, yeah. Yeah. If you, you know, you have, but I did like how they, they took a search centric approach to it. I, I, I want to play with it. I want to have one. Yeah. It, it struck me that it's nothing, not nothing particularly new. And ironically, the geeks already have this and the non geeks is way too complicated. So you think so? I, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure that it's uh, all that. Do you think your mom wants to uh, uh, enter in a search term, like so? She wants to watch House, as they did in the example. I, I think the world is changing when it comes to TV, and the how we use TV is changing quite radically inside the inside the home. Even for normal people, they're sitting on the couch with laptops or iPads or whatever you know, iPhones or Android phones on the couch, and we're talking on Twitter while we're watching, you know. Um, Show different shows. Uh, I mean, tomorrow night is the uh, big final for Lost, and you should see my Twitter. It's been lit up all day, just, I know. you know, with guesses about what's coming, or even there, there's people writing code to remove any mention of Lost from their Twitter stream, you know, <laughs> so that they won't see a spoiler. And <laughs> it's crazy. I never, so, I never got the Lost thing. I never, I never got that uh, that disease. Yeah, I, I got a little hooked into it. Did my you? wife is more hooked into it than I am. But uh, how we're watching TV is changing quite a bit. I mean, uh, and, and we're going to see a bunch of different uh, approaches to how TV is changing. I, you know, there's one coming out uh, tomorrow at the uh, TechCrunch Disrupt Conference that I've seen. I can't talk about it, but they're coming at it from the social aspect. Um, there's Boxy, which is coming out. I think out the Boxy, Boxy box is, is very mm -hmm. neat. Yeah, I, I'm more, most interested in that, but... This does, you know, Google has a brand name and has the ability to make deals with Sony. And, you know, if it comes on, here's Boy, the way that I was. I tell you, that was a, a, a nadir of this, of the event, was when Eric Schmidt comes out on the stage with seven other CEOs. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Ergen from the Dish Network, uh, Howard Stringer from Sony, uh, Logitech. I mean, all the CEOs are sitting there. That's oh, fine. my God. And I can just you imagine see, the developers going cross-eyed at that. It, yeah, some of them did. But did you see... Uh, Stringer kissing up to Best Buy. Yes, that was funny. Yeah. But uh, here's the thing. For a normal person, they're going to walk into Best Buy. They want to buy a 50-inch TV. And there's so many choices that all look the same. I mean, it's really hard to tell the difference between any of the 50-inch uh, HD TVs. I mean, you have to look really closely to see any resolution differences anymore because most of the time they're made in the same factory with different brand names on them. And one of them has this Google brand name on it. Right. and uh, and the salesperson shows, oh, you can search for YouTube videos on it too. And uh, boom, that's you sold. might want as it. long as yeah, it's you not, might want it. Yep. As long as it's not a hundred dollars more or more, right? You know, if it's the same price or twenty bucks, you're gonna buy that and go, yeah, I want the Google thing in there. Throw it in. You know. you know what I'm, I'm waiting for is, like, it seems to me, especially when this HD thing all started uh, in the early 90s when we started talking about, or in the early uh, 2000s when we were talking about the broadcast flag and whether we get a, a digital television transition, it seems to me that the majority of high-def screens aren't TVs, they're, they're computer screens. Right. And it's pretty rare that you get, like, a giant screen and just put one big window on it. Um, 
and so I'm waiting for computer for for rather than um, them to have like computer like UIs to have computer like use patterns. Uh, I have this kind of utopian vision of a living room in which instead of a, a TV being a thing that's kind of isolating, like it seems like one of the big pitches for a giant TV is, "Hey, Dad, buy a giant TV and send the rest of the family away while you watch sports." Um, uh, you know, maybe with your friends, which sounds, which seems kind of divisive. I'd love a giant TV that had uh, like a video window showing something that required some audio, so like a television show somewhere in it, and then um, some games that didn't require audio that had wireless head headsets that kids were playing in the same room on the same big screen, and then maybe some other stuff that someone else was watching, and where we could all pause each other's screens and make something big or make something small. I kind of do this with my daughter now, where in the here's, morning here's she kind of your hatred. Here's where your hatred of uh, iPads is leading you astray. We're already doing that mm. with our iPads. We're playing Scrabble and playing uh, Geometry Wars. Or but you're not all games. looking at one screen. You're looking at a bunch of different ones, right? I, I know, but nobody wants to look at one screen. Well, I, except it, that we are know, still, with my kids, we're still... I have a 16-year-old. He wants to watch his own thing. Yeah, yeah, I no, but Robert, you're missing the point. We're still designing our living rooms around having a giant 50-inch screen at one end. That's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm all about, you know, yes, we've been sharing screens on our little laptops forever. That's that's not an iPad thing. I mean, we've, you know, I've had lands around my house with my loved ones for a long time that we could do lots of things with. My wife's a champion land gamer. She was internationally ranked Quake player. I know about doing stuff on a land. I'm talking about your big screen and whether or not you can have a shared experience with that, so um, if I'm watching I'm Lost, I want it on the screen. I don't want I don't want crap taking any inch of pixel or any numbers of pixels away from that experience. That's yeah, what, that's what I think. I think you sit with spent a lot of money to do HD, do an HD experience for me. I watch YouTube. Well, that's YouTube that's what I'm saying is why is Google ins inserting this crap into the TV signal when really what we want to do is sit with a laptop on our Twitter if we want to do that and and. Uh, Watch TV. Because I, I think the use case is changing. I mean, look at look at what I can do now with a 5D Mark II vid camera. I can get 1080p video up onto YouTube and get mm -hmm. it onto that screen. I, right. the, the final show of House was filmed on the same I camera know. I'm filming all my mm. shows with. So and I have so this thing I do in the morning with my, my two-year-old, who's who um, she's she's got the worst of both of our sleep patterns. I get up at 5, but I'm very energetic. My wife gets up, and she's very groggy. So my daughter gets up at 5, but she's really groggy. So she sits on her own for a while, and then she crawls over to my lap, and she wants to watch video for a little while. So I'll be on my laptop, and I'll put her video in a little corner of the screen using VLC and just have the window manager keep it on the top. And she'll look at what I'm doing, and I'll look at what she's doing, and we'll pause each other's work and talk about it for you know 15 or 20 minutes while we have our little oh, that's video neat. time in the morning. And it's it's incredibly intimate to share a screen that way. It's actually really really nice to do that. It's very friendly. That's because you have a two year old, by the way. Wait till you have a teen. Wait till Posey's 15. <laughs> yeah, well, she won't sit on my lap then. Presumably. She won't be anywhere near you. <laughs> yeah, well, and we're we're like you know we're in that delayed fertility demographic. So when she's 15, I'll be like 100. Yeah, so. yeah. Enjoy it, Corey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, if anything, my 16 year old says, "Get, get let the me hell have a TV out of here, so I can play uh, yeah. an Xbox game, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and enjoy it in its full glory." And and can you go out and get us a pizza? See you, Dad. Bye bye. Yeah. That's really what really, it is. You're really selling this parent, parenthood No, thing. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But it, <laughs> it some, subtly changes, let me tell you, Corey. Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> I, don't, I, 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 uh, I want to save the uh, lightning round for – we got one more commercial before we do that. Uh, what, else did, what else did Google announce? They announced Android. Did I get everything? Google they TV. Oh, VP8. Let's talk about WebM. Yeah, so they announced that, and they also announced a, a data center thing, which is pretty boring, but actually has some pretty in, interesting implications. Well, there were how. rumors that they were going to do an S3 clone, that they were going to have a Google storage clone, and they, they did, did something like that. They there. did it for developers, though. Yeah, and that's what it's for. I, uh, they also announced something with VM, VMware where you could move um, basically servers, virtual servers, from your private cloud to your public cloud to wherever, and that's, that's pretty interesting uh, as an idea. Yeah, yeah, Amazon's EC2, they're doing some really interesting virtual server technologies and all sorts of cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, at Rackspace, we're using uh, VMware for our private cloud, so... I'll tell you sure why this is interesting. It, it sounds like enterprise, but why? What, it's, what ultimately is, I think, intriguing about it is it, it, it reduces friction for an innovator who wants to create a new website, a new service, a new web app, because the storage in the cloud makes it very easy. EC2 really, or Google Code even, makes it very easy... For somebody for very little money to create the next Facebook or the next Twitter, 
with 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 Rex, you know, while we were waiting waiting in line, we were starting up servers from our iPad because we have an iPad client for our Rackspace cloud. I think that's really intriguing. I think that mm. that's 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 very pro innovation in the long run, and uh, and could make a huge difference. We, you know, our, Steve Gibson, who does our security show, told a great story a couple of weeks ago about when he was a teenager and he made the what he called the portable dog killer, which was a sonic weapon. There was a dog that would terrorize people as they walked by, so he created a tight beam, 15 kilohertz sonic beam, and every time the dog came at the fence, he'd shoot the dog with the sonic beam, and it trained the dog not to do that anymore. Then he made the mistake of aiming it at the school principal. But, that, <laughs> but his point was that this was... Was it like a bowel loosener? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah, all right. The point is that uh, he could... He was a maker. That he, instead of sitting and consuming, he created... And, uh, you know, Maker Faire is going on right now uh, in San Mateo. There's going to be another Maker Faire in July. I'm hoping actually we'll go to Detroit for that, one in New York in the fall. Um, this there, uh, and, and Steve's point was we've got to get kids making stuff. We've got to get kids doing instead of consuming. And I think we'd all agree that, that that's what's going on. I'm sure you're doing that kind of thing with Posey. She's only two, but she's she's got to have finger paints and things like that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's it's really amazing the extent to which having stuff to that she can make something with really makes a big difference and Absolutely. how differently she plays with those those open ended toys and that's why i think things like you know uh, cloud storage uh, and google code and ec2 are really powerful because they give people mm -hmm. a chance inexpensively a 16 year old can create the next twitter um, for nothing virtually nothing well or or a 16 year old could create something that makes all of their friends delighted which is you Even know better. just as cool in some yeah, ways right. yeah absolutely i mean I, we were sitting in line with the guy who's the kid who started chat roulette you know and he has 20 mm. million unique visitors a month he showed me his google analytics and it was created using these kinds of technologies it's very very low cost now he's here right he's no longer in russia he says he's moving here so i, I bet he's bouncing back and forth huh. um VP8, WebM, this is a, just to give you the backgrounder on this, uh, Google really was pushing HTML5, uh, uh, open web standards, the idea of getting rid of proprietary stuff like Flash, promoting uh, a standard for uh, video, for, uh, for web apps and so forth. And, and, and the problem is that there is no specified uh, codec for uh, HTML5. Um, there are some front runners, H.264, but the problem is that's encumbered with patents. It's owned by somebody. Um, Og Theora, which is open, although there's maybe some question about it, um, and it, but it's not very good. It's VP3. And then uh, Google bought this company on, too, that has a codec VP8, which is superior. There's some debate about how much superior, whether it's as good as H.264. It sounds like it's not quite as good as H.264, but good enough. And they've decided to open it. And companies like Mozilla, who have been holding off on endorsing any particular codec, say, yes, this is what we've been looking for. Um, it's good for us because we stream a lot of video. And right now we stream it over proprietary technologies like Flash and H.264. I'd love to see VP8 or WebM, as Google's going to call it, take off. Uh, any thoughts on that? Is it uh, any, any good, bad, ugly? I I think this will play for three years from now. They're clearly hoping that there's some new innovation in codec technology that developers around the world will now have a, a say a say in, you know, because it's open source and because there's a little bit of protection from the, the costs of these codecs. And it's, it's the same kind of thing, opening up uh, the video uh, in the same way that, the, you know, uh, these inexpensive servers opens up development. There I'm is. Well, I think that I think what everyone's worried about is the drug dealer model, right? Where you can use it for free for a couple of years right. until it's totally embedded in your business, and then it suddenly costs a lot of money. That's H.264 uh, you know, right now, you know. Yeah, and you know that maybe the cartel that controls it or the company that controls it today has claims with all sincerity that they have no intention of doing it, but you're 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 kind of betting that no one over the life of the patent ever ends up in control of it with dollar signs in their eyes, or uh, no one ever ends up in control of it and decides, you know, the kind of material you make is unsuitable for our codec. You know, we don't like porn, or we don't like subversive material, or we don't like material that um, is hosted on services that infringe on copyright. So unless you're willing to do what Viacom thinks YouTube should be doing, which is um, paying a lawyer to review every clip before it goes live, you know, like 30 hours of video a minute. So exhausting the total supply of lawyer hours remaining between now and the heat death of the universe, you know, so unless you're doing that, 
uh, you can't use this codec for it. You know, if, if the codec is controlled by someone, they can condition your access to it in any way, right? Any way. So do you believe that Google, is there a way Google can give away uh, WebM in, in such a way that you would feel comfortable with it? Well, I guess it just may, it depends on whether they make like permanent and irrevocable representations about what the terms are of use for it. Yeah. I mean, we, there is such a thing as a permanent and irrevocable. Good. So that's what use. we should be looking for. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think that's right. I mean, this may be a better question for Denise and this week in right, law. Right, right. But it sounds to me like like that's the kind of thing where you have to you have to have really good binding long term promises made. I don't know when the the patents in um, in the onto codec expire. I saw a demo of it in '99, presuming they didn't you know get any more patents filed. Like kind of sort of think around 2025 maybe at the latest. So you kind of want promises that go out for another 15 years. Um. Let's see, what else? I think that's it for Google I.O. I think that's it for Facebook. We've thrown a little Apple in there. Let's take a break and come back. We're going to do a little lightning round. A bunch of stories. Some good stories, too. I see that Toyota and Tesla are going to revive the Fremont Numi plant and uh, start making electric cars there, which would be fantastic news, I think. That's the, the local auto plant that was shut down mm. just recently. Uh, and, uh, and the 23,000 reply-all emails. <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a second, but I want to mention our friends at audible.com. Yes, Corey, audible.com. <laughs> you want to take a I've break I've got something now? good to say about Audible. What is that? So with Makers, they agreed to drop the DRM for my audiobook. We, we still had some, some uh, questions about it. We didn't end up going with them, but they, they agreed to drop DRM for my audiobook. I thought that was really good of them. Um, the problem was, of course, that Apple said, if you don't put DRM in it, we won't carry it. <sighs> So, and Apple's the main, the major. See, this distributor. is the real question: is who is enforcing this DRM stuff? Is it the publishers? And and we had this conversation before, where you said you tried to get Audible to do with that DRM, and they said, no, we're just not going to do that. So they changed their mind, you know, to their yeah, so that's good news. Credit. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, but but Apple refused to uh, Apple refused to to carry it in the iTunes store. They said DRM or nothing. Uh, it's very frustrating. So much for Steve Jobs, much vaunted hatred of DRM. Yeah, huh? no kidding. I don't know what that means exactly. Um, well, here's the news. For the record, if if Apple would allow me to, I I put all my uh, audiobooks in the iTunes store like a shot with with no crazy EULA and no DRM. I'd be all over them like white on rice. Wouldn't that be great, Steve? Yeah. Steve. Hey, um, I did record an audiobook for uh, 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 one of your short stories. What's That's the, right. What's what happened with that? So that's uh, that'll be coming up probably this autumn. Uh, it's a short story collection called With a Little Help, and um, it's made with a little help with a lot of from a lot of my friends. So there's an audio book that will be free, and you can buy it on CD. Uh, so it'll be free downloads. Uh, there's a, um, a printed book. You can either buy it with one of four different covers from uh, Lulu. Or you can get it as a free download. Or there's a very limited edition hardcover where each each book has uh, custom end papers that are original paper ephemera from writer friends of mine. So Jay Lake sent me his cancer diagnosis, and um, uh, Joe uh, Joe Haldeman sent me his watercolors. Uh, Kathy Koja sent me her grade two report card, and those original pieces <laughs> of paper will be That's stuck great. in as as the end papers. Um, and then the top top end was that you could commission a story from it for ten thousand dollars. But um, Mark Shuttleworth already bought that, and I wrote that story. He did. Already. Oh, that's yeah. great. Oh, that's yeah, wonderful. So that'll be out in the autumn. And all the financials are published monthly as an, an appendix to the book. And if you send me a typo for the book, I'll correct it in the next copy printed and give you a footnote. So maybe you buy another copy to see one with your name in it. <laughs> that's very smart. Corey, as usual, I, pushing... I monetize typos. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's, now that's creative. With a little help, we'll look forward to that. And the audio book, I'm on it. I know Neil Gaiman uh, read a story yeah, on it. Yeah, and um, uh, Mary Robin at Coal and um, Will Wheaton. Uh, a lot of great readers. And, and just to foster the open source of it, I did the recording sessions on Twit Live live. So they were... You're and awesome. it actually was really fun because people corrected me when I when my accent changed. They said, no, no. <laughs> oh, that's great. I had no idea. That's what oh, yeah, a great it was story. Fun. It was really fun. I really enjoyed doing it. And uh, they I think they enjoyed the story. And I'm sorry it took so long, but I'm glad you got it in time. And you did I an look awesome forward job. to that. With it's a, a great reading. Oh, it was fun. It was really fun. However, let me talk about a little bit about uh, commercial audiobooks from our friends at audible.com. Audible is, as many of you know, um, uh, kind of a lifesaver for me. When I, I first started using Audible when I was commuting to San Francisco. I did that for 10 years, two hours sometimes each way. 
And I would have, I'm sure I would have just gone bazooties, uh, if not, uh, you know, kind of had some sort of road rage incident if it weren't for these audio books. I started first listening to cassettes, but when Audible came around, man, it changed my life. And now Audible's got 75,000 titles. They've got a huge collection of science fiction. They're doing a lot of sci-fi that was never turned into audio books. They have a Audible Frontiers collection where they built their own studios and they're recording a lot of this great stuff uh, that has never been recorded before, which is wonderful. Uh, audio books, performances, radio shows, comedy performances, tons of wonderful stuff at audible.com. And I know Corey liked Audible books too. He has a whole bunch of them. Um so let me see if I can make a good recommendation for you. I see there's one. This I'm, For nostalgic reasons, I might get this. The Astronomer, a novel of suspense. It's on the front page, narrated by Napoleon Solo, the man from Uncle, my Robert Vaughn. <laughs> I just like his voice. I don't know. I might just get it for his voice. You're, you're agreeing? Yeah. All right. <laughs> anyway, here's the point. You get two free books, two credits. That's almost any book in the house. Uh, all you have to do is go to audible.com slash twit2 and sign up for the platinum account, two books a month. That's that's what I've got. Every, I love it. On the 22nd of every month, just happened yesterday, I get two new credits, and then I have so much fun going through the audio books and looking for two new books to listen to. All right, now I'm listening to this. I really love The Time Traveler's Wife. I I, I have to highly recommend that. The, the movie was beautiful, but the movie's two hours. This is a really excellent, long book. Um, have you ever read The Time Traveler's Wife? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great book. Do you know if they've got any Kathy Koja, K-O-J-A? I will look. She, I know she's got a bunch of audio books. She is one of my favorite young adult writers. Uh, and if you're looking they do. for Kissing book, the Bee, Buddha Boy. Uh, Kissing the Bee is great and Buddha Boy. They're both, and they're both really good readings. I've reviewed both audio books. I'd, um, I'd really recommend them both. Uh, anyone who's got kids, they're, they're good kind of meaty, subtle books that never clobber you over the head about, about kids who are a little bit different and about how they kind of end up fitting in. Kathy made her name as a really prominent horror writer oh. and then gave it up to write these young adult novels that are just genius. Well, you've done two young adult novels now. That's right, yeah. It must how be nice satisfying. It might, it, might, <laughs> it, might be, it must be very satisfying. I have to say, one of my best audio uh, audible experiences is getting a few great audio books like Bud Not Buddy and, um, uh, oh, uh, I can't remember a few. We got three or four, and we drove out to Montana and listen to them. And now talk about a togetherness experience. It was really wonderful to listen mm -hmm. to them together and talk about them. That is a great use. And a juvenile is, is by somebody who's really good is great because adults will enjoy it as much as the kids do. So it's really something to talk about. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a popular misconception that young adult books are for young adults oh, as God, opposed no. to books that can be enjoyed by young adults and adults together. Yeah. Oh, you that... know, if you like Alice in Wonderland or The right. Hobbit, you like young adult books. Exactly. Kathy Koja, these are two good recommendations. K A T H E K O J A, Kissing the Bee and Buddha Boy. Make those your first two books, especially if you've got kids around. Uh, maybe like 12, 11, 10, thereabouts. Um, I, I'd say like 13 and up. 13 and up, okay. Yeah. Uh, 13 and up. Uh, Audible.com slash twit2. Two free books for you. They'll play on any, uh, almost any device. They're still working on the Android, although I understand that's in beta now. I've talked to a couple of people who have uh, the beta edition. So that's coming soon. Audible.com slash twit2. We thank them for their support of twit. So your new one uh, is FTW. What's the story of that, Corey? So for the win, it's it's a book about gold farming, which for those of you in your audience who, who aren't uh, gamers, gold farming is when someone in a video game does a repetitive task to amass virtual wealth, like, you know, making shirts out of sheep to get gold or, or killing low-level monsters to get gold, and then sells that gold to other players who are either too impatient or too short on time to do those repetitive tasks themselves. And, and this is not um, science fiction. This exists. No, that's real. There's like 400,000 people who are a living doing it today. Uh, most of them are in poor countries, and most of the people who buy the gold are in rich countries. And For the Win is a, is a kid's book about what happens when the gold farmers form a union and use video games to outsmart their bosses and, and uh, <laughs> unionize and start the first independent, large independent trade unions in China and, and other countries where it's illegal to unionize. That's so um, great. And so it was a really fun book to write. I borrowed a little uh, gimmick from uh, a great writer named Ken McLeod. I called the union the Industrial Workers of the World Wide Web, uh, which is a, a joke. For those of you who know, you're 
labor history. It's a it's a little funny pun, <laughs> and um, it's a it's a book that's like it's got lots of great adventure and action because you know they're they're fighting these pitch battles in video games and they're fighting pitch battles in the streets of Mumbai and in China. Um, but the but it's also a book about economics and about social justice, labor issues, uh, behavioral economics. It was a lot of fun to research and to write, um, and the reviews have been great and the tour has been great. Everywhere I've gone, it's been packed houses. That's so neat. So they're going to be in New York next week for for your New York readers. If oh, you good. Google for the wind tour, you'll find it. Or just go to to craphound.com slash FTW. You'll find the tour schedule. That's awesome. So instead of Wobblies, they're what? Webbies? Wef, wef, they're Webblies. 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 <laughs> Webblies. The I W W W W. The Webblies. <laughs> the Webblies. <laughs> Corey Doctor. The Gamers United the will never be defeated. Yeah. I, they need a song. We have a song. That's right. A uh, quick round of uh, of uh, stories. Uh, so, uh, my my friend uh, Jason Calacanis kind of got in a little bit of a trouble uh, the other day. He has a uh, an emailing mailing list uh, that with t more than twenty three thousand people on it. Apparently, misconfigured the reply all sent emails back to everybody on the list, and uh, so all of a sudden, <laughs> people are getting messages back offering jobs. Somebody figured it out said, well, I might as well include a shameless promotion since this is like a big party now. So uh, Jason... To unsubscribe, just die. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise you're stuck. Jason <laughs> discovered it in the wee hours of the morning and disabled the list, but uh, there were 34 reply-alls that went out to more than 23,000 people. The, the best thing I've ever done this year in terms of productivity is learn how to use Gmail's uh, filters. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Gmail's gotten better and better now. They're getting, they're, they've got folders now and they've got, I'll tell you. I've written about 800 filters so Have far you? in the last three three Holy months cow. and it just has made a dramatic pr pr uh, production improvement on my email. Wow. I live and die by mail filters. My two favorites, um, one colors the message differently if it's from someone who's in my address book, which is just such a no-brainer. It should be automatic. And I, and I have it set so that I, every time I reply to you, it adds you to my address book. So I can tell email from people I've corresponded with, with people from, pe from correspondence from people I haven't. And then the other one is that if it's someone I haven't ever corresponded with, but I'm the only person on the two line, uh, it colors it differently. Right. So it can distinguish mail, like bulk mail from individual mail. And those two things, sorting it by color, has been really, really good at making sure I don't miss the spam. That's or the non-spam, rather, the ham. That's very yeah. Eudora of you. You do that I, with K9, or what do you do that with? No, I do that. I, do, I don't do anything fancy with K9. I only use K9 sort of walking between a place where I'm using my laptop and another place where I'm using my laptop. No, I use Thunderbird. Thunderbird. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I got like, you know, three or four million archived emails at this point, and... and you know, sticking them up on Gmail or something, even if I wasn't worried about the privacy stuff, sticking them all on Gmail is like, you know, months of uploading. Uh, yeah, you surprise me when you say you use Popmail. You don't, you don't, is, is that why you don't use IMAP? Same reason? You don't want to keep the stuff on the, some, some, somebody's server? Well, I used to use, I used to have the best IMAP config. I had a local IMAP running on my own computer. This was back when I was using a Mac and I was using it under OS X. So I had an IMAP server running on my own computer. And then I had lots of different mail clients on the computer, depending on what I wanted to do. So some are really good at searching and some are really good at filtering and some are really good at composing. And so because I could keep them all in sync with the same local IMAP server, it was really easy to just use them all. And then there was an update to OS X and it didn't, um, WFTPD or WU IMAP whatever the Washington University IMAP didn't work anymore uh, and I just gave up and I never went back to it and I was thinking the other day you know I, I'm up to like a 500 gig hard drive in this ThinkPad I've probably got enough room to make three or four copies of my mail spool I should really do that because it was the most it was the best fun I've ever had with my mail <laughs> it was super ninja email stuff yeah and then you can use proc mail and stuff and really kind of filter it like crazy oh yeah I just saw an amazing presentation by the woman who's the chief scientist at um, Bitly about her spam filters, which are so good that she no longer checks her mail. Her mail sends her a text when there's something good in it. Oh, man. Is that online Talk somewhere? Talk about Nirvana. Is that online somewhere? I want that. She's putting it all on GitHub. She's putting all her scripts on GitHub. All right. Hillary. I've forgotten her surname. I want to say Mason, but that's Hillary not right. Hillary at Bitly. I'm writing it down. I'm going to find yeah. a link. Uh, Buy.com has made its biggest sale yet. It sold itself. $250 million to Rakuten, a Japanese company that runs the biggest e-commerce site in Japan. I was thinking of that because my uh, IMAP company, Fastmail, just got sold to Opera. So Opera's mm. in the IMAP business. I don't know if that's good or bad. Hmm. Uh, here's a story. Norwegians are cool. They're cool. I like Norwegians. <laughs> yeah. 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 They got awesome sweaters. 
<laughs> they have to. Uh, let's see what else. HP expands recall of notebook computer batteries due to fire hazard. We always enjoy those stories. Um, Bill Gates, more profit than profit. This is with an F and not a PH. Uh, this is a great article in The Atlantic analyzing Bill Gates's predictions from the last 15 years ago. He wrote The Road Ahead. Apparently not exactly The Road Ahead. He wrote about email, for instance, 15 years ago. Electronic mail and shared screens will eliminate the need for many meetings. Well, let's go to meeting, right? When face-to-face -face meetings do take place, they'll be more efficient because participants will have already exchanged background information via email. Well, that's true. He said we'll be able to carry a wallet, PC, in our pocket or purse. It will display messages and schedules and let your reader send electronic mail and faxes, monitor weather and stock reports. Sounds like an iPad. Or maybe a smartphone. Or a phone. Yeah. His prediction, the wireless network of the future will be faster, but unless there's a major breakthrough, wireless networks will have far greater bandwidth. Mobile devices will be able to send and receive. The wireless networks of the future will be faster, but the wired networks will still have better bandwidth. I get it. Okay. Mobile devices sure. will be able to send them. Of course. That's the uh, duh. Mobile devices will be able to send and receive messages, but it will be expensive and unusual to use them to receive an individual video stream. <gasps> I hope not. Wrong. Let's see what else. Real quickly. 30 years of Pac-Man. Did you see the Google front page search had a JavaScript Pac-Man on it? Wait, Bill Gates predicted 30 years of Pac-Man? No. <laughs> 15 no, years ago, he said <laughs> Google before will have... 30 years of Pac-Man. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so it's interesting because, you know, I, as a science fiction writer, I'm always struck by the number of people who think that I'm trying to predict the future. And I, I think that science fiction writers have never been very good at that. But what you can often tell by reading someone's predictions about the future is what they're worried about in the present, ah, what, what, what their hopes and fears are about right. technology in the present. And Mary Shelley wasn't worried that, you know, animated corpses would stalk Europe. Mary Shelley was worried that technology was getting out of control and that, you know, Frankenstein's monster would be kind of a metaphor for all of us. Uh, you know, Asimov had a lot of faith in big institutions like the New Deal and so on. And so he wrote about the foundation, right? He wrote about a 2,000-year future history projection where a group of wise people around a table could predict the next 2,000 years of human history and make sure that it didn't go off the rails. It's a very New Deal way of thinking about uh, about the future. So you, you can often learn a lot about the present and, and about the past from looking at futuristic predictions. You can rarely learn much about the future from that. You know where I think science fiction authors do influence the future though because a lot of mm. future scientists read science fiction and then end up working on stuff that science fiction predicted yeah that's very true yeah of course you've got you know the, the metaverse being echoed in right. um in second life you've got arthur c clark predicting orbits that then people built in but that's that's slightly different from predicting that this is kind of inevitability anyway right. let's talk about pac-man pac-man 30 years old and on the google Page. Isn't that great? This is actually really as much a uh, demonstration of it, what HTML5 could do. It's the first time I can remember a Google Doodle actually being animated like this. I think that's right. And Google's kept it alive, by the way. If you go to google.com slash Pac-Man, it's still there. So I think the next Doodle is going to be um, one of those under construction animated GIFs. <laughs> And and for what what to do what? <laughs> just just you know as a get a thirty years of under construction icons on the web. <laughs> That's a good idea actually. Somebody told me if you insert the coin twice, you can get Ms. Pac Man. Oh yeah, there yep. she is. Yep. <laughs> Very good. I like that. Uh, let's see. Twitter expects. You know, it's funny. Uh, before you go on, the first gold farmer I ever knew, or I ever knew, I used to hang out at an arcade in the Shepherd Center in North York and Toronto, and there was like we would cut class to go in, but there were older kids. You know, we were about fourteen. There were kids who were about eighteen or nineteen who just dropped out entirely to hang out at the arcade. And there was one guy who was kind of a like a part-time hashish dealer, full-time gauntlet hustler, and so he would play <laughs> gauntlet all day long. And you get in, you kind of you cut after lunch, you get in around one or two in the afternoon have you set up, huh? he would have built up like the most epic valkyrie and he'd sell it to you for a dollar and he was like he was like the world's you know worst paid stoner gold farmer of the late 80s wow <laughs> that's you're right the, a proto gold farmer that's right uh twitter expects hundreds of advertisers this year that's exciting twitter plans to have hundreds of advertisers using its new ad system in the fourth quarter as the company ramps up to become a self-sustaining profitable business 
Do you, you use Twitter, Corey? I see you on Twitter. I do. Yeah, I, I, I find it. I, you know, I had no idea what it was for. Like, I, I, Ev sent me an invite when he first started it, and I had one person on my follow list, and it was configured to use my phone. And basically, every turn I, time I turned my phone on, it would tell me a whole bunch of things about what this guy I barely knew was eating for breakfast. And I just, I was like, wow, this is the dumbest service ever. Ev, what's wrong with you? And then I was at the O'Reilly Tools of Change conference, and uh, we were using Twitter to follow it and comment on it. And all of a sudden, it was like the scales fell from my eyes. So I started of really using it a lot and now I use it all the time now it's it's kind of a, a an all-day everyday thing it's actually one of the, the, the crazy weird things about Twitter from this this book tour is it's like getting the reviews in real time so right. I get off I get off stage finish doing you know a two-hour three-hour signing uh, and on the way to dinner I'll look at my tweets on on the phone and it'll be like this this kind of all the stuff that people liked and didn't like about about what what just happened, which is a really interesting uh, thing. Normally, you know, the way you get is is you know the next morning you get a few emails, but this was really real time. Yeah, I think you probably experienced that as well, um, uh, Robert. I mean, this yeah. this thing now when we speak, you know immediately how you did. <laughs> it's kind of scary. I look at the reviews for the shows as, as, as they happen as the show's going on. Well, while you guys were talking about books, I was reading all the tweets going on about the show. So. Yeah, there you go. Mm. And but I'm using Buzz more and more. I really love Buzz. I know Robert, you've kind of given Buzz some love lately. I'm 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 hoping Buzz kind of, which is the Google Twitter. Um, that we didn't hear much about Buzz at the uh, no, uh, they, Google I/O, but they uh, did announce an the API. API yeah, they it. finally have an API, and it is possible now to write third-party applications. Seismic immediately did it on Seismic Web. And, and I'm on a an NDA a beta program, and there's a bunch of features coming. Good. So. I'm excited. I love Buzz. I really do. Uh, Yahoo is uh, has decided that they want to be I don't know what a content company they've just purchased for a hundred million dollars one of these demand media type companies associated content you know what demand media is that's where uh, somebody looks and sees what people are searching for hires somebody really cheap to write some really crappy content around that because they know it's going to drive a lot of traffic sells ads on it profit. And Associated Content complains to have something like 30,000 bloggers they pay something like $5 a, an article for. And now I guess Yahoo's in that business. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because another word for demand media is magazine, right? Before the web came along and blogs and so on, uh, the way that you know you would be crazy to like spend a lot of money publishing a magazine unless you thought there were people out there who wanted to read it. So, so the magazine formula goes, find something that you think other people care about, find someone who can write about it, have them write about it. Uh, and that, for me, the amazing thing about, about blogging now, which I've been doing for 10 years, has been it goes like, take something that you're really interested in, write about it because it costs nothing to publish it, right. and then see if there's anyone else out there who likes the same stuff as you. And boy, that's way more satisfying. Maybe it's more indulgent, but I find it so much more satisfying. I agree. I agree. Uh, you don't like the tail to wag the dog. We do. We kind of do the same thing here. We, we think mm. about, would anybody be interested in this show? But ultimately, we do the shows we're interested in. And what's it cost you to do a show that you don't like? Right? I mean, people right. go like, look at all those blogs that were abandoned. Doesn't that show that blogger is pointless? It's like, you know how much it used to cost to find out you right. didn't want to publish a magazine? Right. You know, thousands, millions, people lost their houses. Now you can yeah. find out you don't want to publish a magazine in an hour for free. Tom Merritt's coming over here June first. He's going to start the, with the news show. But Tom and I were talking. And I think we're what we. It was his idea. And I really like to do this. A sh maybe it was Ken Shepherdson's uh, another new hire. A show a day. We're going to launch a show a day in August. Every day, oh, in, every day a new show. And then we were also this week in dog hair. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Show a day. And then and, <laughs> and then uh, and then uh, and then we will use Kickstarter to uh, say, okay, here's five. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Here's five shows. That's pretty cool. The first show to reach five thousand dollars will launch, and we'll use that money to launch the show. <laughs> mm, How about that? Good idea. Yeah, just same idea. So I shouldn't really knock demand media, except that I do knock anybody who's cynical enough to put out crappy content just because you'll find it. Mm. You know, I, I yeah, like, and you know it's funny because like I, on the other side of that, you get all this spam for write articles for money, uh, which is actually a really old scam. If you if you get like old copies of like Popular Mechanics from right, the fifties, right. the the write articles for money scam has been around for you know I think that you know there's there's a cuneiform on a on a stone tablet somewhere that says etch tablets for money. How much money do you make etching tablets for money? Well, I think you get uh, at least one goat a month. <laughs> Robert Scoble, what are you up to these days? What's uh, what's new for you? I know you're uh, 
cranking Amazon out great Tech video. Show and uh, go to New York for the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference. And that's the, that's, that. that's on right now. I know Sarah Lane is out there. We're also hiring Sarah Lane. She's going to start June 1st as well. Very cool. Uh, she's, she's out called. there. Yeah. And uh, so what do you expect at, uh, at uh, Disrupt? Anything well, disruptive? Well, I've seen a few of the companies. There's one. For, well, I can't talk about them. I'll get them kicked off the stage. All right. That's we'll find out. Cool. We will find but, out. But well, there's some, some pretty week. interesting companies. Uh, one will make Windows dramatically better, which is really cool. And one is going to bring social to TV, which is also pretty interesting. Sounds good. Whether it's going to win or not, we don't know. Let but that's thousand, what's thousand fun about startups. Bloom. Absolutely. Robert Scoble is the Scobelizer, S-C-O-B-L-E-I-Z-E-R.com. His blog post today got responses from Facebook's vice president of global P positioning. <laughs> Global yeah. positioning. That guy is awesome <laughs> with a sat nav. <laughs> what is this title? They, Global. They know where I am. I'm carrying two GPSs just in case they can't find the first one. You know, the man with the, with the two GPSs never knows where he is. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> It's like two watches. Uh, That's right. Uh, Elliot Schragen, also uh, an email from Mark Zuckerberg. So I know you're you're the guy if uh, people want to get a hold of you. Scobalizer.com. And uh, we'll look forward to videos from Disrupt. And, uh, of course, um, it's all uh, all there. At, uh, and are you still doing, uh, what is it, Warehouse 52? What is the? Uh, Building 43. Building 43. <laughs> .com. The, the center of the Internet. <laughs> Corey Doctorow is at craphound.com. Find out about his new book at craphound.com slash FTW. And you're and I uh, edit Boing Boing. Oh, I, you know, I forgot Boing Boing. Let's leave that out. Boing Boing uh, .net, which is the, 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 editors. the original, the blog, and uh, a must read every single day. If you're not reading Boing Boing, you're missing some great stuff. Really, Thanks. really great stuff. Hey, that's what it looks like with the ad blocker turned off. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Corey! <laughs> Corey! You're not supposed to say that! Golly, uh, Corey. At least, at least he's not uh, trying to, uh, you know, goose up his own revenues. <laughs> no kidding. I love it. <laughs> we won't tell Mark you said that. Oh, I'm just kidding. Jeez. John Battelle's going to uh, kill yeah, you. So, and I'm going to be in New York next week for uh, Book Expo America, and I'm doing uh, live events at uh, two stores in Manhattan, one in Brooklyn. And then I'm going to be in Toronto on June the 4th for the big Canadian launcher for the win at the Merrill Collection. That's exciting. Toronto, your hometown. It is. I'm going to see the family. Back home. That's where his server. Your home is where the server is. That's right. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Don't forget, we do shows about all of these subjects. In fact, we're doing more and more live coverage. If you were watching Wednesday and Thursday morning, we did live coverage of the Google I.O. keynotes with commentary by Kevin Marks, uh, our own Larry Lanigan, and Tom Merritt. And uh, we will; those videos are on our Twit Specials feed at twit.tv. Um, Mark Fronfelder will be on Net at Night this week on uh, Tuesday to uh, talk. What's he going to talk about? Boing Boing? Oh, he's got a new... I think he's probably talking about his new book. He's got a new book. That's right. Yeah, he's got an awesome book about making stuff by hand and the, the, I love the quiet it. dignity that accrues there, too. I love it. Yeah, we just got the book. So that'll be fun. And we have a show called This Week in Google on Wednesdays. There's lots of good material. Make sure you check it all out at twit.tv. Subscribe to this show at twit.tv uh, or on iTunes, the Zoom store, anywhere. Finer podcasts are carried both in audio and video now. And we're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash... Twit. Thank you all so much for being here. We'll see you next week. Another Twit. He's in the can.